This program is made possible in part by... Daimler Chrysler Corporation Fund. As part of its commitment to provide information on important contemporary issues to public television viewers nationwide. In a wide open political race, Nicholas Hood would like to make the leap from the Detroit City Council to mayor. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Darrell Wood. Nicholas Hood has strong ties to Detroit's religious community, but does he have the experience to lead a major city? Nicholas Hood answers that question and others next on American Black Journal. Welcome to the program. Nicholas Hood III sees the race of Detroit mayor is shaping up this way, and I quote, What you will have very soon are two political machines battling and one independent candidate, end quote. A second-generation Detroit City Council person with strong political connections, Nicholas Hood believes he is that independent candidate. Nicholas Hood III joins me to explain why he is the right person to lead Detroit into the new millennium. Nicholas Hood III, welcome to the American Black Journal. Thank you. First off, I'd like to say that name recognition, six years on the council, and a political name that all Detroiters should be familiar with are your strengths, obviously. What keeps you from appearing to be a political insider, as insiders these days are typically seen as part of the problem in many cases? I've been on the city council actually seven and a half years. And uh, I've had uh, an opportunity to shape legislation. I'm the author of the Municipal Civil Infractions Ordinance. Uh, for the whole seven and a half years that I've been on the city council, I have championed what I call quality of life issues. Mm -hmm. I've put money in the city budget for more inspectors, money in the city budget for increased grass cuttings, not of the, only of the city parks, but also uh, for vacant lots. And um, I've just tried to champion those things that I believe are quality of life issues. And um, to the question about being a political insider, you know, I am a part of the government right now, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that that is a negative. Um, the quote that you gave earlier, you know, is one that uh, I gave to one of the newspapers, mm -hmm. and I told them that, you know, we're four weeks away from the, the filing date right now, and basically you have two candidates who are, are aligned with either a political machine or big money interests, mm -hmm. and then you have me. And I'm somewhat unique in the political process. I've had an opportunity to uh, enjoy a certain degree of freedom mm -hmm. that most local politicians don't have because I pastor a church. I'm the pastor of the Plymouth United Church of Christ. I have about 2,000 members, 900 families, and uh, give or take a few. And uh, what that does is something that traditionally the black pastor uniquely has been able to do in America, which is that my constituency um, is not controlled by Wayne County. My constituency is not controlled by gambling interests, but my constituency is a church. And because of that, it has afforded me these seven and a half years on the city council, remarkable freedom where I've been free to vote my choice and vote my conscience. Mm -hmm. When the mayor approached the city council and said that he wanted uh, gambling on the East River, I said no. Uh, when the mayor said that he wanted uh, a fee f to enter Belle Isle, mm -hmm. I said no. And I said no because I think that we're the highest tax city in, in, in the state. I said no because I think that parks ought to be free. I said no because I think that you know people who live in Detroit ought to get something for their tax dollar. Mm -hmm. Now, I could say no unequivocally, or I can say yes unequivocally, because frankly, you know, I'm in the government because I'm doing it for public service. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing this because I get a free car. I'm not doing it because it's aiding in my kids' college education. Uh, my church pays me very well. You know, I'm in government because I just simply want to leave the city a little better than I found it. I grew up in Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved here in 1958 from New Orleans. Right. I was born there and uh, went through the first grade in New Orleans, moved here. From the second grade on, 
uh, with the exception of the ninth grade. I've been in the public school system. And uh, it's been a good experience for me, but I'm in the government today because I grew up in a Detroit where I could take the bus early in the morning. I could take the bus late at night. I played uh, in the band at Cast Tech. We had sectionals mm -hmm. early in the morning, seven in the morning. I had to be at school often at, in the evenings. I was taking the bus late because we were playing all the time. And uh, I grew up in Detroit where there were businesses all up and down my neighborhood on Dexter and Fullerton, the mm -hmm. Dexter Davison area. Um, everything from little record stores to Sanders ice cream parlor, you could get your shoes repaired. Um, in Detroit right now, you know, I mean, it's a far cry from the Detroit I remember. Well, let's take a look at, uh, before we address some of what Detroit is and is not, as we remember it, let's take a look at your general platform. There are those who say that uh, Nicholas III uh, has a shot at being mayor, but that you don't come across as the strong political leader that Detroit needs at this critical hour in its existence. Your platform, I guess, may address some of those concerns. You are for moving away from all of the heavy concentration on downtown Detroit and redeveloping the neighborhoods. True or false? I'm for developing the neighborhoods as well as downtown. And my voting record has substantiated that. How would you strengthen and improve neighborhoods while maintaining a focus on downtown Detroit? I'd like to do it uh, by using what I call five cornerstones. The first cornerstone is an aggressive land reuse strategy, which would basically have something akin to an Urban Homestead Act mm -hmm. to give the land away for free to nonprofit developers and to uh, subsidize for-profit development in the city by allowing a tax credit uh, for every dollar of investment, either for new construction or renovated housing and uh, retail and, and restaurants in the city. Mm -hmm. Two, I'd like to couple that with a radical redeployment of the police department uh, to police back in a model that we had uh, earlier in Detroit, more by precinct, less by dispatching from downtown. Mm -hmm. I want every citizen in Detroit to feel like they have a personal relationship with their police department. Number three, I would redevelop the neighborhoods by combining those first two planks with effective code enforcement. Mm. There are a lot of good laws on the books right now. I wrote one of them, the Municipal Civil Infractions Ordinance. Matter of fact, my brother told me the other day he got a ticket from a law that I wrote. And uh, I'm very pleased because that law has been on the books four and a half years mm -hmm. and the administration is just starting to implement it. But what it does is it will actually allow for building inspect inspectors to ticket people who are zoning violators, people who are running repair shops in their neighborhood, people mm -hmm. who are parking tractor trailers in their block, people who uh, are keeping their property unsightly. Mm -hmm. uh, laws that already are on the books, but my law will actually let the city recoup the dollars, whereas the current law, uh, the, the previous law, would not. Mm -hmm. and, and so by using laws like that, uh, we, we will clean the city up. The fourth area that I want to focus on as a mayor is I would like to marry the city's budget with that of the Detroit public educational system. Mm -hmm. I am a product of the Detroit public schools. And uh, I'm convinced that with only 30% of our children graduating on time, mm -hmm. with the underperformance on the ACT, the SAT, the MEEP scores, um, our, and, and our kids being underprepared in the kinds of subject matter that the jobs of the future require, chemistry, biology, and math, that it's long overdue that the city's budget not be more focused in dovetailing with the public educational system. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. We do it in several ways. One, as a mayor, I want to take the block grant monies of the city and have a greater focus on the education of youth. And simply to use a model similar to what has been employed in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, they, their program is called the Front Porch Program there, where the mayor directly takes money uh, or gives money, makes money available, makes grants available, block grant monies available to nonprofit groups and church-based groups who are doing good works. And what I want to do is directly fund those groups that are targeting efforts for public educational school kids out of their churches and nonprofits, out of the mayor's office. And to make it really work, I would work together with the public educational system and say, okay, show us the resources that you're using to prepare the kids for SAT. Show us the resources you use for the MEEP tests. Uh, show us the subject matter you're using for chemistry, biology, and math. 
for algebra and calculus and trigonometry. And we want to prepare our children and we want to augment what you are doing eight hours a day. We want to extend that for another two or three or four hours in the evening. I'm convinced that if we can do that as a city, that our children, one, are going to be healthier mm -hmm. because uh, you, it's less likely a kid's going to get into trouble if they're in a coordinated program. But two, you're going to have a better educational product. And so that's something I want to do. Another thing I want to do relative to education is to reach out to the corporate community in different ways that we've reached out heretofore. In the past, the corporate community has indicated that they will help, you know, if, if they're just asked. And so when the bond issue came up last summer uh, for repairing the schools mm -hmm. and the call was made for the corporate community to come out and to inspect the work that contractors were performing, they showed up. What I want to do is to take the corporate response to another level. I want to say we have 250 some schools in the school district. Mm -hmm. I want every school to be adopted by at least one corporation. And regardless of what that corporation uh, has to offer, if they're engineering, I want them to bring engineers into the schools. If it's a law firm, I want them to bring the lawyers. Uh, whatever specialty that they have, I want them in the school district because it's my conviction that when a child has an opportunity to see a person like yourself up close, they see you on TV, mm -hmm. but when they see you up close and they can reach out and touch you and they realize that you're a real person, then all of a sudden it begins to click in that child's mind that, well, hey, maybe one day I can grow up and be like Wood. Mm -hmm. One day I can be like Hood. One day maybe I can be somebody great. Part of the reason why I'm front running for mayor today is because, as you said earlier, I'm mm -hmm. a second generation city councilman. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a house where my dad was a city councilman. But, you know, before my dad was a city councilman, I was born in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. We lived in the house where Andrew Young and his brother and mother and father were until the parsonage was built for my parents. And so growing up in, in that kind of environment, being kicked in the pants, slapped in the head, tugged on the ears by a guy like Andy Young, who when I was younger, I just thought he was a silly guy. Mm -hmm. But as I got older and I realized this silly guy worked with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., became a congressman, uh, became an ambassador to the United Nations, and then subsequently was a mayor of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I said, well, hey, if that silly guy who's cracking jokes, kicking me in the seat of my pants, tugging on my ears, making jokes and acting silly, can be a mayor of a city, who knows? Maybe I can too. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of experience that I want the public educational system kids to have. I want them to see the people who are making things happen right now, to touch them, to smell them, to look at their clothing, and to say, hey, maybe one day I want to be just like that guy. There's a fifth element. And I want you to hold up for just a second because we're going to take a break. Okay. And when we come back, we're going to let you tell us what the fifth element is. All right. Stay right there, Councilman Nicholas Hood III. When the Journal continues more of our conversation with mayoral candidate Nicholas Hood III, keep it right there. Of course, you're watching The American Black Journal. Welcome back to the program. My guest is Detroit City Councilman and Detroit Mayoral Candidate Nicholas Hood III. Just before the break, uh, Councilman Hood, we were talking about the five elements in your plan for success for the city of Detroit, revitalizing the neighborhoods in particular. You were just about to tell us about the fifth element. The fifth element is this, uh, and just so that your viewers don't forget the first four, uh, aggressive land reuse, mm -hmm. number two, uh, redeploy the police by neighborhood, Number three, effective code enforcement. Number four, coordinate the city's budget efforts with the public educational system's mm -hmm. goals. The fifth element to me is, is to have a healthy Detroit. There are 250,000 people in Detroit without health care mm -hmm. right now, which means that if you and I have a heart attack doing this show, uh, you've got to go to the hosp excuse me, hospital and share space with people who are using the emergency room for primary care. And I don't fault a poor person for using the, the uh, emergency room for primary care. If that's all they have, that's the best you can do. But what I'm saying is we as a city can do better. The city's health department today is only seeing 60,000 people mm -hmm. per year. 
And if you have 250,000 without health insurance, that lets you know that you've got this great gap. And uh, what it means is that people are dying unnecessarily. What it means is that people are not getting the kind of primary health care that they should. And so what I want to do is to find a way, I'm already working on it, frankly, with a number of doctors and other health professionals, to work out a health agenda for the city that will take the city's health department and to use it as a bridge mm -hmm. to connect with the efforts of the DMC, Henry Ford, St. John, and Trinity Health Systems. Addressing the needs of people. People may not necessarily want to or be able to get jobs at companies which are not locating within the city's borders or have transportation to get out to where those jobs might exist. What is your plan or at least your thought on developing a strong entrepreneurial base, starting with our school kids and moving through our neighborhoods? Well, as I indicated in the earlier segment mm -hmm. of the program, I think that the key to the redevelopment of Detroit rests on what we do with our children. Uh, because they're still at an impressionable age and uh, you can give them the kind of tools that they need to get the jobs of today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The bigger problem is how do you deal with their parents? How do you deal with the adult generation today which is underprepared um, for the jobs of today? And I think the way to do it is through retraining. Detroit already has a great mechanism um, in its, um, well, I'm slipping the name of it, uh, the department that does the, the retraining. Okay. Um, it's, uh, golly, I'm drawing a blank. Our, our job retraining department. Yeah, our, 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 it's, it's not called that. But and, it's and in our public school system, Willie, we have a great Willie uh, Walker is the, develop, is the director of it. It's a tremendous plus, program. Plus the fact that we have Things a great Detroit vote. Works. Okay, and our vote tech education system within Detroit is a resource that I still contend is greatly underutilized. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you, you start there, but also... I think in, again, I would go to the nonprofit communities and other, uh, the faith-based, church-based communities and say, help our people learn to read and write. Father Cunningham, before he died, mm -hmm. the head of Focus Hope told me that one of his great challenges was that the average reading age of the incoming students at Focus Hope was at an eighth grade level. Mm -hmm. He said they have to be able to read and write at a 12th grade level to perform the kind of engineering concepts which are trained and taught there at Focus Hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what he's doing is reaching down first to Central High School, then he went to Glazer Elementary to make sure that there's a seamless educational product. What I want to do in the city is to reach out so that nobody is left out. Um, and it's, it's a tough, tough nut to crack. It certainly is. I want to move along uh, as we try to address a number of different concerns. I'm going to backpedal just for a second briefly. One of the things that you have indicated of late is that the police department is a major issue in this campaign. You've been quoted as having said that in a recent interview. You've also called for the resignation of Benny Napoleon, who has said that he will not continue as the police chief. You wanted him replaced. Why did you want the chief of police replaced? And why have you been at odds with him as the leadership of Detroit Police Department? Well, you know, I don't know how much you followed uh, my work on the city council, mm -hmm. but I've been very supportive of the police all along. But, but uh, not the police chief. Well, no, I've been supportive of the chief uh, for the most part through my tenure. But when we went through the last budget cycle, he presented some numbers, uh, just a, a fact sheet uh, for crime stats in the mm -hmm. city. And what it showed was that there was an overall decrease in crime by 12.7% mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, I just took it. I accepted it. I said, well, that's what the chief said. And I said, boy, that's a great report. Can I see it? And he passed a copy of the report over, you know, through one of my staff people to me. And I just took it. And I didn't think anything of it. Uh, but, you know, I have a public school education mm -hmm. and Wayne State and a Yale education. I took the sheet. And I just looked at it. And I mm -hmm. said, there's something that doesn't add up here. I said, there's a 12.7% decrease in crime, but commercial breaking and entering increased 6%. Rape, I think uh, statutory rape on that sheet was up 70%. Mm -hmm. And so the next time the chief came to the city council, I began to ask him, I said, what about these numbers? What about commercial breaking and entering? What about rape? And uh, he said, well, they're all down. I said, but not on the sheet that you've given me. And then he said, well, obviously you're reading the numbers wrong. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with that sheet. Where'd you get it from? I said, got it from you. Mm -hmm. And then when he may be you know, seem like maybe I was lying or, or misreading the numbers. I said, that guy's got to go. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Because anybody who will misrepresent what was on a sheet of paper he gave to a sitting city councilman mm -hmm. uh, is probably, you know, sitting on a lot of other bad stuff. And that happened, I called for his resignation in October. I have no personal problems with him. Uh, and as I said, you know, I gave him the benefit of the doubt before that. But for anybody to impugn my character and to suggest that perhaps I was reading the numbers wrong or just making up something, mm -hmm. uh, I took great offense at that. I still take great offense at it. And uh, as it's turned out, since I, I called for his resignation in October, you've got a federal investigation ongoing that both the city council and the mayor have called for. Uh, day after day, we learn about other horror stories from the police department. We've learned that more people are unfairly, uh, unlawfully detained by our police department than any other department in the whole United States. We've learned that more people are dying at the hands of our police than the law to, the police departments of LA and New York, and Washington DC and Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong. And honestly, the only reason why I called for his resignation was I said, the guy's lying to me. You know, and I just don't understand that. You know, why he would do that. And as it's turned out, it was just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot that's wrong there. But I would also say that the police department, though it has a number of problems, mm -hmm is probably the easiest department to solve out of all of the city's departments for this reason. It is a paramilitary organization. If you have a police chief who's in sync with the concept of neighborhood policing, right. uh, and, and along with a mayor who understands that. And you have been critical that this is not the style of policing which has not been pursued by right. this Philip, particular leadership. Well, it's not just uh, Chief Napoleon. Mm -hmm. It goes back to his predecessor. They together really philosophically believe in a concept of policing more by special unit, mm -hmm. uh, which in theory has more cars on the street, but the actual sense that the citizens get is that they don't know where the police are. My goal is to have 10 to 12 cars, marked cars on patrol in every precinct all the time, not two or three like what we have right now. Mm -hmm. With 4,000 officers, I think we can do that. One of the things I'd like to do, actually, you know, people may be surprised. I'm a pacifist, I'm a nice guy, you know, as you've already said. But I want to give the police more firepower. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I actually, you know, I, I want to make them a stronger department. But I also want to increase the checks and balances on the police mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, things don't get out of hand to, to reduce the risk of problems and, and abuse and civil liberty abuses with the department. I think it's very possible. We've got a professionally trained police department. Mm -hmm. They already know what to do. It just starts from the top down. Very briefly, I'd like you to give me an encapsulated statement regarding what it would mean to make Detroit city government more responsive to the needs of the people. And when I say that, I'm talking about those things which you've already indicated make a city work. Buses that run on time, streets that are well lit, police and fire, snow removal that is timely uh, and well staffed, and clean neighborhoods. What will you do, in a nutshell, that will make this city work? What I want to do is focus on all of those things that you just mentioned, but the five cornerstones that I said, the aggressive land reuse, code enforcement, policing by neighborhood, coordinating with the public educational system, and then tying that all together with an effort for a healthy Detroit. And I think that if we do those things, um, the, the city will take care of itself. The growth and the development will follow if the government sees itself more as facilitative and not dominating. Uh, you can't dominate the development of a city. That's a problem that this administration and the previous administration have fallen into. Mm. Our challenge as a government is how do you create a, a playing field so that the people who want to develop, the people who want to build houses, the people who want to build restaurants will want to come here. I want to have incentives for growth. Uh, of the restaurant community, where do you eat in Detroit? Mm -hmm. Where do you go to the movies? We have one movie theater now, and that's on 8 Mile. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I want to go to eat, and I live on the Lower East Side, when I want to go to eat at, at a restaurant uh, outside of my neighborhood, if I want to, and in my neighborhood, believe it or not, on the Lower East Side, there are actually a couple of nice restaurants. But if I want to go to the movies or go to a national chain restaurant, there are two questions that I ask, and I believe almost all Detroiters ask them. One, do I have enough time to get there before the kitchen closes or the movie's on? And two, do we have enough gas? Mm -hmm. We are so, see, even you're going to laugh at that. We're so accustomed to mediocrity in the city, we've just grown to say, okay, 
I just accept that. If you live between Woodward and Evergreen, six mile, eight mile, where do you go to eat dinner if you don't want to eat your home cooking? Mm -hmm. I and mean, there are a few, you know, independent restaurants, but basically, you've got to be there a, are no you've got to national be a real franchise Detroiter. restaurants you've in got, that area. Yeah, you've got to be a Detroit insider to know where the restaurants are. Except for a Pizza Hut on mm -hmm. Seven Mile and Myers. And, you know, who wants to eat pizza every night? You know, I don't mind pizza every now and then, but, you know, give me a choice. And so I want to subsidize mm -hmm. the growth of those kinds of industries. Councilman Hood, I'd like to continue, but we're out of time. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you. Here's hoping you'll be able to get a great fast food meal tonight before you get home. <laughs> we thank Councilman Hood for joining us once again. That's all for this week. And if you would like more information on the subjects discussed during this program, send us email at abj at detroitpublictv.org or call the viewer hotline at 313-876-8394. And of course, you are watching American Black Journal. This program is made possible in part by Daimler Chrysler Corporation Fund. As part of its commitment to provide information on important contemporary issues to public television viewers nationwide.